So you can do anything as you want. If you wanted to fix the interference issue, you could take from below the base circle and cut this out even more. Okay, and so like this, you can see apparently this is the base circle and this is the involute part, but below this, this part was not involute, so you can cut it, you can do whatever you want, and if you cut that out uh, properly, then, then those things won't dig in and interfere. Okay, so you can fix this a bit by, by cutting those out. However, it's, it's really not a good solution, okay, because... Um, it definitely weakens the gear T so they fail at much smaller loads. Okay, so you can think of these as, as kind of gear teeth. They're like cantilevers, if you will. Uh, you know, imagine you bolt one of the gears and you try and twist the other, that, that, the other gear. Um, if, if you undercut a lot or even more than nothing, right, then you're going to make the base of these cantilevers uh, much more compliant. And, uh, and, you know, usually in engineering you want compliance is the whole purpose of my compliant mechanism class. But this is one scenario where you want these teeth to be as rigid as possible um, because you don't want them giving, you don't want them deforming. Uh, you can imagine if they deformed when you rotate one gear, if the other gear is held fixed and those, those teeth can deform, uh, then they, they can, they'll prevent that tooth uh, from rotating. When you, when you rotate one, you want the other one to immediately rotate. You don't want it to lag or, or have any give in the teeth. And, of course, for the same load, uh, compliant uh, gears will not only deform more, but they'll, they'll, they'll break sooner. So, so uh, you want those to be really rigid and strong. Okay, so undercutting is not a good idea and only something you want to do if you have to move with a bad gear set with interference and you want to uh, fix a lot of the issues with interference, then, okay, maybe go ahead and undercut it. But of course, the much smarter thing to do is to uh, just design the gears so that uh, C and D lie between points A and B, and then you don't have to do undercutting at all, and you, you get your cake and get to eat it too here. So, okay, so let's look at the consequence of misaligning gears, okay? So, um, these circles I'm showing are obviously the pitch circles, okay? Um, say you have gears and you're going to misalign them, okay? Well, what does misalignment mean? It occurs when the gears are not mounted at their intended separation distance. In other words, they're too close or too far apart. Now, one thing to point out is we, we live in an imperfect world. There is no possible way to uh, uh, not misalign gears, okay? They're either going to be too close and overlapping or they're going to be too far apart, okay? Now you can say, well, well, what about, what if I allow them to, you know, be off axis? You're just talking about misalignment along the, the red line here. Well, if you shear it or misalign it in this uh, axis, then basically you're just uh, moving the center over and the center here, so you could actually think of these as being the same thing as this. We just kind of rotate our frame of reference here. So um, if you think about it, you, you really can only misalign gears along the line of centers. Um, you know, misaligning them tangentially is nonsense. You're, you're essentially just misaligning them by pulling them further apart in, this, in that instance, okay? So, so I just want you to realize you can only make them too close or too far, okay? If the gears are mounted too close, then they'll jam, they'll generate a lot of friction and will likely fail more quickly. So you probably don't want to if, you, if you're going to mount them, uh, you know, and you're going to either be too close or too far apart, you probably don't want them to be too close, okay? Because you, you may not even be able to assemble them. Uh, the gears will be all deformed, and there'll be some serious sliding and friction as they operate, and they'll be very energy inefficient, and oftentimes they deform their axis, um, you know, that they're, that they're mounted on. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, there's bad things, okay? So you don't want that. You don't want jamming, and they won't operate smoothly, okay? So if you're going to misalign them, and you will, you want to just misalign just a hair uh, too far apart, if anything, okay? And, of course, try and get them dead on, but uh, err on the side of too far apart, okay? Well, what's the, uh, what's the, what happens when they're too far apart? Well... Um, if the gears are mounted too far apart, okay, the distance between points C and D shorten and backlash occurs, okay? So what is backlash? So you can imagine here these, these gears are theoretically perfectly mounted 
and these ones, you can imagine this is too far apart, okay? So you might notice this space here, um, you know, it, is, it starts opening up. When, when they're mounted perfectly, um, right, which is only mathematically possible, there's, there's no space there. And that means if you're, if you're driving this gear, um, first of all, as you're driving it this direction, the, the driven gear is rotating and everything's working great. But then say you stop and you want to go back the other direction. Well, the second you stop, that one stops. And the second you start moving in the other direction, this one starts moving in the other direction. So there's no, there's no lags, there's no slop in, in, the, in the gears when they're perfectly mounted. But when, you, when they're misaligned just a little too far apart, you open up this space, and that space is called backlash. Because, yes, it's true, when you drive it this way, for the, the way it's drawn, this will immediately go. But then you stop it, and yes, that'll immediately stop. But then if you start driving this the other way, the whole time that the, this tooth is rotating the other way and closing the gap of the backlash, that gear is not moving. And that's a problem. That's called backlash. That's slop. You want immediate response in either direction of the rotation of the input with, at the output. And if you misalign them, you'll get the backlash and you won't get that immediate response. So that's what backlash is. That's what it's called. Okay? And so backlash occurs in gears that aren't perfectly mounted and misaligned. Now, of course, if you, if you misalign them and put them too close, you're definitely not going to get backlash. But again, you, you'll get jamming and friction and all sorts of issues. Okay? So, um, yeah. So, but if backlash is a big deal to you for whatever reason, you may want to more misalign it being too close. Okay? Okay. So, um, but the other insight I, I mentioned in here that I didn't clarify is that the, the more you pull these things apart, you might notice the addendum circles kind of start lifting away from each other and the C and the D come closer together, okay? Um, so that's an interesting insight, and I'll, I'll mention some things about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, just know that that happens. As you misalign them further apart, C and D come closer together, which, which means uh, the range that the gears are actually touching when they first touch to when they release that, that, that travel from C to D, that distance, is, is shorter, okay? Now, it, it's, it's useful to think, well, what doesn't change? Like, you know, by separating the gears, we don't change the number of teeth, obviously. It's not like suddenly one of the teeth falls off or something. But, you know, by misaligning them, they stay the same number of teeth. They, of course, have the same addendum, dedendum, and base circles, right? Because those are inherent to the gear, not the gear set. Uh, you know, you, you can't change a gear's addendum, dedendum, and base circle once it's fabricated. So we don't change those. But what do we change is um, we increase the size of the pitch circles, we change the pitch point, and increase the pressure angle. Okay? So, so you can think about it. Here, in both these diagrams, believe it or not, even though it doesn't really look like it because of an optical illusion, the orange circles are all the same size. They're, they're identical, okay? The, meaning the base circles are the same size. So, so if you have these gears and they have the same, you know, they have the, these, uh, you know, fixed base circles, of course, because their involute profiles are fixed. Um, but then you misalign them, pull them apart. Of course, the base circles are going to stay the same, as we just discussed. But the, but the pressure angle is going to change. So here, the closer they are, the pressure angle is small. As you pull them apart, you can imagine the pressure angle increases. Okay? So pressure angle increases. Uh, line of centers between the two centers gets further apart. And uh, the pitch point where those two things intersect um, you know, may, may change. In this case, you pull this down, the pitch point went down. Um, and the, the, the pitch circles that go through the pitch point uh, get much larger, okay? So those things change, and so you think, what are the consequences of those? Well, um, the, you know, so you might, you might be worrying, like, oh my goodness, by pulling them apart, does the fundamental law of gearing not work anymore? And no, fortunately, these values change the same proportion amount for both gears involved, so the fundamental law of gearing remains satisfied and the angular velocity ratio remains the same. Um, so what, what that means is, you know, if you misalign gears by pulling them apart, you know, even though you change the pressure angle and the pitch circle and the pitch point and all these things, um, once they're misaligned, uh, they, they still obey the fundamental law of gearing. Th that new pressure angle stays the same. Uh, the line of center stays the same. This line of action stays the same. 
the pitch point stays fixed and uh, thank heavens, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the involute profiles still are touching on involute profiles and, and everything, you know, still works. The, the, the angular velocity ratio, uh, you know, it still remains constant and that doesn't change. That, that's the important point is the ratio of R2 to R3, even though R2 and R3 get much larger for the, this scenario, the ratio is what stays the same. And so that, that's very good because that would be a real bummer to design gear teeth to have a very specific uh, angular velocity ratio and then you slightly misalign them, which you always will, um, and it, that would be devastating if, if somehow that ratio changed. Well, it doesn't. Not only does it still obey the fundamental law of gearing and they're constant, but the very ratio doesn't change. Okay, so thank heavens for that, right? Because then that would make gears so they're not even a usable technology, right? Um, it, especially if it was sensitive to those changes. So. Okay, so misaligning them, they stay obeying the fundamental law of gearing, the ratios are still constant, and they're the same constant value, okay? Um, but one final point I want to notice is another thing that changes is you'll notice the distance between A and B gets further apart, and remember I told you the distance between C and D gets closer together. So this is another fix for interference. If you have gears that, uh, you know, you've designed poorly, but you have to stick with them so that uh, when they're perfectly aligned, um, A and B lie between C and D, so there's interference, right? Well, and, and say you didn't want to fix that issue by doing undercutting because it weakens the teeth and, and kind of ruins the gear a bit. Well, another fix you could do is just kind of misalign them, pull them apart if you can tolerate backlash um, at, to the point where a and B now move outside of C and D, and C and D go inside of A and B. Um, and, and once they do that, you, the, the issue of interference will go away, um, uh, right? Um, and you won't have to undercut. So that's another fix for interference, is just misalign them, pull them apart. Um, but again, that's going to introduce backlash, and the teeth will be touching for less time uh, between C and D, and th there's, there's consequences of all those things, okay? so. So, okay, fantastic. So if you understand everything in this lecture up to this point, uh, you were, f you know, masters of fundamental gear mechanics and understand all the things you'd want to look at in designing or uh, analyzing a, a gear to know uh, whether it's, it's doing a good job or not, okay? Okay, so let's look at different kinds of, of gears. There's external, which we've solely been looking at up to this point, in, in, involute, uh, so, sorry, rack and pinion and internal gears, okay? All right. So here's external gears. They're the ones where you have two circles touching externally, okay? Here's internal gears where you've got a gear inside of a gear. This is, this is usually called the ring, and that's, that's the gear, the, the pinion inside the ring there. Okay, so there's internal gears, which we haven't looked at yet. And then there's rack and pinion, which is essentially um, a combination of the two. So you could imagine if I made the radius of, of this, uh, this wheel one infinitely large, it would turn into a rack, and this pinion would still be the pinion, the smaller gear there. Okay, and the same thing with this. If I took this bigger outer ring gear and made it infinitely large, it would also flatten out, and it would be, again, a rack and a pinion. So... So um, this is kind of the middle ground between these two gears as you, as you change their outer rings, uh, ra you know, uh, radius to infinity. Okay, so, but those are the three kinds of uh, mating uh, gear types there. The external, internal, rack and pinion. Okay, so let's look at these principles we looked at for rack and pinion, also called involute rack, right? Um, so... Uh, one thing that's interesting to note here is that um, the, you know, if you, the radii of the rack's pitch and base circles are infinitely large. Okay, I just said that. So if you take an external gear and you make its, uh, its, its pitch circle infinitely large, then it will, you know, re remember if you take the radius of any circle and, and grow it to infinity, once it reaches infinity, the circle is now aligned. So here's, here's the pitch circle uh, of the um, of the rack, and and of course its addendum is up at the top here, and its dedendum circle 
Those are also obviously have an infinite radius, and so they're straight lines. And again, of course, note that the pitch circle, this, this line now is between those two. The base circle, of course, is also have an infinite radius, but it's, it's interestingly enough, infinitely far away. Okay? And um, if you lift the string off of a straight, you know, infinitely large circle, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and which is now a straight line, you, you get, you draw straight lines, okay? So the, the uh, involute profile on any rack that's straight, right, which is what, what racks are by definition, um, you, you're, these, these are very simple to calculate. They're just straight lines, right? Um, but they're still considered involute profiles because that's what happens to an involute profile when the base circle is infinitely large, okay? Okay, so that's what this says. Note that the teeth of the rack are straight lines. But also note here that um, nothing really changed about this. We have the addendum, the dedendum circle, the pitch circle here. Still where this line crosses this circle is still the pitch point. There's still a point where they first touch and release, and there's still a pressure angle here um, that, uh, that, that's relevant, okay? So now let's look at internal gears um, and see what happens with this, okay? Um, so here we have an interesting situation. Um, notice, of course, that uh, the, the ring or the outer gear still has a pitch circle, okay? It's this guy right here. And it still touches this, this gear's pitch circle. Um, and they're both tangent and they touch at point P. And they still have a line of centers and everything. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, you know, that, that's, that's still all consistent. And of course, you have the addendum circle here, which is the top flat, and the dedendum circle at the bottom flat there, okay? But here's the interesting thing. The base circle of the outer ring, in this case, is down here. And you can imagine if you lift the string off of this, it actually does this inverted involute uh, tooth. So, so you can kind of see here these teeth uh, look very strange. Um, Right? You're used to seeing gear teeth that look like actually the blank of this, right? But this is, this is now where the tooth is, okay? So, and that's a consequence of the base circle is below all this and it lifts up. And that's what's needed to, to make these things mesh, okay? So, and again, they still have pressure lines. They still have all these things. Everything I taught you still applies. It's just uh, for, when, when the, for ring gears that, uh, w with pinions inside of them everything's kind of inverted uh, when you design the teeth, okay? Okay. Okay, other kinds of gears. Here we go. So let, let's look at here. So, so far we've really been looking at uh, spur gears with just straight up and down teeth that are either external involute rack or internal gears. Um, but let, let's look at other gears, okay? So this is an interesting uh, kind of gear set called helical gears, okay? And uh, helical gears have teeth that, you know, instead of, if you look at a spur gear side view, the teeth go straight up and down, like I was, I was mentioning. It's basically, if you imagine just taking a gear's profile and extruding it, that's a spur gear. If you turn it on its side, that's what we're looking at here. Okay, whereas helical gears, uh, these are not just simple extrusions. They, they, they kind of wrap around here, um, either in straight lines or, or kind of curves, right? Is, 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 uh, uh, anyway, my point is it's not straight up and down, okay? Um, uh, that's, that's the side view there, okay? So these gears are, uh, you know, very interesting. First of all, there's right-handed and left-handed versions. With spur gears, there's no such thing as right and left-handed. They're all the same. For this, you think you take your take your right hand, and you know if you look at the direction they're bending, that's your thumb there. And here, you you take your left hand and look at the direction they're bending. There's where your thumb goes there. So there's a left-handed and right-handed uh, nest to these. Um, and for these to mate properly, uh, they need to be. Uh, opposite, right? So if you want them to be on parallel shafts, which is what most gears are used for, and you want to transform, you know, the rotation from one shaft to the next at different speeds and stuff, of course you'd want one to be bigger or smaller if you did that. In this case they're both the same, so they're going to have the same speed. It's the same stuff. Um, but to make them mesh, they need, one needs to be left-handed and one needs to be right-handed, okay? So they need to be opposite-handed to, to, to mesh together, okay? So, and here's the thing, they're less economical, meaning they're more expensive, okay, and, and that's obvious because, you know, they're, they're much more difficult to fabricate. You can imagine spur gears, you could just grind on the teeth, 
or stamp them. I mean, there's many ways you could make the teeth of Asperger. Any, anything that's just an extruded 2D shape uh, is going to be easier to fabricate than, a, than an arbitrary 3D shape, okay? Like, like these uh, helical gears, okay? So they're, they're less economical and more expensive, but um, in many instances, they can be worth the added cost, okay? And the reason is, is they, they can transmit rotations on parallel shafts with much more uh, speed and load, and they do so much more quietly. And to give you an insight, I, I drew this picture to give you an insight why that's the case. So you think of spur gears as they mesh, at any one instant, they're really only touching along a line, which is you know, why, of course, they're lower pairs, right? Or sorry, which is why they're higher pairs, because they only touch along a line. And that line is just a nice straight line that spans the depth of that, uh, that gear, however long they are, right? Or however far they're extruded. Okay? Well, helical gears, even for the same extrusion thickness, uh, for the same thickness here, okay, because they wrap their, their teeth around in angled directions, um, you, you could think, well, which line is longer? Is this line longer than this? No, uh, of course, you can fit a longer line by angling it, which means that even for the same extruded thickness, you get more contact to spread the force out on. Right? So that force for just a spur gear has to be held along this, just this short little line. But for helical gears, at any given point where they're in this line contact or curve contact, they, 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 have, um, they have much more, uh, basically, kind of area, you can think, to distribute that force. So the pressure is lower. Okay? And that's why they can handle much higher loads and much, um, uh, much higher speeds, of course. And they also happen to be much more quiet, okay? They, they, um, they don't make as much noise, okay? Now, one downside, another downside of them beyond just being expensive is that they, they not only generate um, forces in plane like spur gears. Of course, spur gears have a force, as we'll see, uh, you know, directly a radial force and a tangential force that allows them to, to rotate. Um, spur gears, their forces are just in the plane, in, in the plane of the, the, the circles of, of the gears, right? Um, these gears not only have those forces, but they also have thrust forces that are out of the plane. And those, those need to be accounted for with special bearings that can also be expensive. So, um, you know, the, the axial thrust loads can be an issue. So one way to fix this issue is to, instead of use helical gears, uh, use herringbone gears, okay? Herringbone gears are basically, you know, uh, basically two um, helical gears uh, just kind of stuck together where you take the left hand and right hand and stick them together. And, you know, so, so instead of just straight lines across or even angled lines, you have these V-shaped grooves. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like one helical gear here, one helical gear here. <coughs> Sorry, fused together. And, um, of course, these are also not terribly economical. Um, but um, they're really great because, um, because you get these two different handed kind of directions, you, you cancel out that thrust force that can be uh, irritating. Okay, so herringbone gears are fantastic. Um, they, they're almost universally used for efficient transmission uh, where you, you want, uh, you're dealing with large powers, high speeds, and, and you want it to be quiet. So again, you get the huge load capacity because instead of just doing the straight lines across, you do now these large V's. So you distribute the force over a very long line. Um, and so you can get much higher loads, much higher speeds. Uh, it's still very quiet and you don't have the axial thrust issue. So mounting them isn't, uh, isn't a problem. So herringbone gears are great. Okay. All right, so one other interesting thing is, is if you um, say you want, so so far we've really only been dealing with gears that are, uh, you know, parallel axis gears that are mounted with parallel axes, okay? The question is what if you wanted either intersecting axes or, uh, or skew axes, okay? Well, well, we'll get to intersecting axes in a minute, but um, you could just take, you know, of course you can't take traditional spur gears and, and and make their axes skew. They're not going to mesh. Um, but you can take helical gears. Uh, the exact same helical gears I showed you, 
except instead of mounting them along parallel axes and using a right and a left-handed opposite ones, which is what you'd need to do for parallel mounting, you take either both right-handed or both left-handed and mount them like this so that they're along skew 90 degree axes. So they can do 90 degree skew. So the axes neither intersect, you know, they're not parallel and they don't intersect, but they're skew, okay? And, and they're skew at 90 degrees. You can achieve that with these uh, cross axis helical gears. Same as the previous helical gears, um, you just do two right-handed or two left-handed ones, okay? Okay, um, this is what I said, okay? So uh, their gear teeth are always the same, are always going the same direction. They are either both right-handed or both left-handed. That's what I said. Now, the, the final thing to note here is this is a, it's actually a, it's a solution that works and it, if all you have is helical gears and you really need skew axis then then now you know how to do it but if you were ever actually building a machine you wouldn't want to do this it's a bad idea and, and I'll tell you why and that's because um, when you do this they actually only touch at a point so even spur gears touch along a line and when you mount helical gears right and left handed on a parallel axis they touch on a, on a much longer line um, or curve, right, that, that, that distributes the force and you can get a higher load and these kind of things. But um, if you click on this YouTube link, it'll show these animating and it'll be clear that they only touch at a point that kind of shears along as the teeth engage. So as a consequence, because it's only, you know, the force is focused on just a single point, it does not take high load capacity. They can very easily break. Uh, they, can, they can be noisy. They, you know, they don't take high speeds and they generate friction and there's a lot of sliding and, and it's it's not a smart solution okay so but it, it works okay if, if you really need to okay we're gonna look at better uh, 90 degree skew axis solutions uh, for gears in the future here but um, for now let's look at uh, bevel gears now bevel gears are great when you want to to have um, axes of rotation that intersect so if you think about this one you know these are bevel gears that are cut at some angle the axis of this gear comes up through there and the axis of this gear comes through there, so they intersect, okay? And, and uh, bevel gears, that's, that's the solution you definitely want to go with. Um, now, these are kind of straight tooth bevel gears that are kind of analogous to spur gears. And they're cheap and everything, but you can, you can if you really want high load capacities, high speeds, efficient, quiet, and you also want intersecting things, then you want to use spiral bevel gears that um, you know use these uh, you know these these uh, you know curved or, or angled um, teeth uh, that that uh, distribute the force over a longer length. Okay, uh, so the same concept as helical gears. It's just to get a better gear, but of course you're going to pay for it with uh, it, it, it's more difficult to fabricate. Okay, so this is, remember I told you we're going to get back to if you want to get uh, gears on uh, perpendicular skew axes, but you, you, you're smart enough to say, hey, I don't want to use helical gears because they're junk for that application. They only touch at a single point when you use both right-handed or both left-handed. If you want to get past that and still use you know, skew axes that don't intersect um, and they're skew 90 degrees, a, a much better solution is worm gear. Okay, where the worm is basically like a screw, and the gear here, the, or the wheel, is just like a traditional gear. And um, you can see um, they interact with line contacts instead of point contact, and so they can have much higher load capacity speeds and all these things, and it's a much smarter solution than he mating heel hoo gears, like I said, um, and th so they can carry more load. Um, and the trick is, there, there's, there's kind of a nice trick about the geometry of this, is they're not back-drivable. And by back-drivable, I, I, you know, and that might not be the right word to use for this, but, but what I mean is, is you need this to be the input, okay? So you, you, you drive this here, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and here's the output, and it'll work every time. But if you, if you want to switch and say, no, no, I want this to be the input, uh, you can't make this the input and drive the worm gear. Okay, so, so some people, when they mean back drive, they mean you rotate this way and then can you rotate the other way. And yes, you can rotate both ways, but I mean uh, you, you can't put, make this the input and rotate it because that's not going to turn the screw, right? It's just going to jam. 
if I tried to rotate this guy, it's, it, we're not going to start rotating the, the worm. Uh, or the screw um, about its axis. So it's, it's going to lock up. So, and that, that could be a 